Okay, in a previous video, we discussed the relevance, um, you know, the continued relevance of mechanized versus light um, forces or mounted versus dismounted forces. We're not repeating that today. Today, what we're going to do is a comparison and contrast of various forms of what we might call light infantry or dismounted infantry formations. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each one of those formations and why do we tend towards these? Now, having said that, let me go ahead and lump that in mechanized infantry, which includes wheeled and motorized infantry. Um, as a general rule of thumb, it also includes naval infantry, what we here in the United States call the United States Marine Corps, um, and sometimes called Marines other places, but often more often called naval infantry. Now, naval infantry have to come, you know, to the shore with boats or Amtraks or some kind of vehicle. And so, at least nominally speaking, that's mounted. That's how they get to the battle, right? Then they dismount. But that doesn't make them light infantry, at least in, uh, you know, U.S. doctrine terms. I think the uniqueness there, and this is another caveat, is that once they get to their objective, the United States Marine Corps has the full myriad. They don't even define themselves in units such as uh, where Helleborn infantry or amphibious mounted infantry or whatever, things like that. They just don't do that. They say, well, we're light infantry, we're mechanized, we're just Marine infantry is what they say. And that's fine, but that is an anomaly. Most of the world, the naval infantry is a mechanized force in one form or another, a mounted force. Putting naval infantry and mechanized forces to the side, I'll leave a, you know, some kind of call out uh, somewhere uh, so that you can go take a look at that video. I want to jump into the different types of light infantry. Let me say that light infantry is kind of a catch-all. It's probably better described as dismounted infantry, but let's go with light. It's the more common term. So light infantry includes um, light infantry and jungle infantry, sometimes called tropic infantry or tropic light. That's a variation of it. Um, a mountain and arctic infantry. Right? And yes, there are mountain infantry and Arctic infantry, two different things, but remarkably similar, so I'll discuss them together as well. Air assault infantry um, and airborne infantry, not the same at all. There's certainly uh, similarities between them, but as you'll see, very remarkably different missions and formations. Light infantry and jungle infantry. In the traditional sense, um, these formations are specialized in small unit decentralized warfare. Way back in Napoleonic warfare, they might have been called pickets and things like that. They're the skirmishers up front um, that you see even before firearms. They were skirmishers and guys throwing slings and things like this. But they were specialized in small unit decentralized warfare in the French and Indian War here in America, as well as in the Revolution. They, those light infantry formations were heavy into reconnaissance and would range forward, thereby we get the term ranger. And so these are all forms of light and jungle infantry. They have foot mobility. Uh, they're also often called foot soldiers in other military formations and military traditions. So light infantry are and jungle infantry are foot soldiers. Um, they carry a fighting load. Full stop. What? They don't carry a sustainment load? A rucksack? No, no. You're talking about something else. You're talking about alpine infantry or air assault infantry, and we'll get there in a minute. Light infantry do not carry sustained loads. They carry a day's walking ration, enough ammunition to sustain them for an 8 to 12 hour fight, something like this over the course of a day. They generally move in the daytime. They certainly can move at night, but they carry 35 to 45 pounds. Since the days of Jesus Christ, the infantry have carried one third their body weight. The average American grunt is somewhere around 150 to 180 pounds, meaning they should carry, with sustainment loads, 50 to 60 pounds. We don't carry anywhere near that in the United States military, not the Marines and not the Army. Our infantry uh, regularly hit 90 to 120 pounds. So yes, if you're saying, well, hold on, that's two-thirds their body weight not one-third their body weight. You're correct. This is the problem. And oh, by the way, light infantry don't do that. 
their sustainment loads are reinforced daily. They are brought up on other kind of log trains or logistical trains. Whether it's brought in by a helicopter or a truck or Jeeps or ATV four-wheeled motorcycles, it doesn't matter. The fact is they're brought in by other vehicles uh, at the end of each movement, let's say an eight, 12 hour movement, and then all of that logistics. The nighttime defensive perimeter is set up with barbed wire and sandbags and overhead cover and mail comes in and more ammunition and water and you know medicine and all of these things. They come in, they set down to um, dig in their nighttime defensive perimeter or daytime defensive perimeter, and then after rest, let's say, you know, whatever, six, eight, 12 hours of rest, they pick it all up, they step off with a fighting load, and the trans comes back in. That is the logistical trans comes in, polices everything up, and the light infantry step off for their next day of movement. That is how light infantry fight. You know, jungle warfare has slight variations of that, um, for obvious reasons, restricted terrain, but that's how they fight. Light infantry are, one of the reasons they are so ubiquitous throughout the world is they are so cheap. This is very, very affordable formations, at least in terms of military spending. This is incredibly affordable. Developing nations can afford light infantry, jungle infantry. The problem, of course, is that when light infantry are caught in open terrain by enemy mechanized cavalry and or close air support and or artillery, the jig is up. Um, they are not really capable of fighting against these kind of enemy formations unless they are in favorable terrain. So when they're caught in the open terrain, and open I use loosely because it just generally means flat. Again, tanks can go through trees. Um, if they're caught in that, oh, they, they've got a problem. And so this is the big problem, is that light infantry, jungle infantry aren't a one-size-fits-all solution. They have very serious limitations in capability. Let's talk about a variation of light infantry called mountain and arctic infantry. Um, they are specialized, as it sounds, to an environmental climate. Very similar to jungle infantry, but they are less like light infantry. Even though they still use fo foot mobility, because as light infantry, they're augmented by vehicle, drone, or pack animal, mules, donkeys, whatever. Vehicle, drones, or pack animal um, augment their movement. So yes, mountain and arctic infantry also carry just a fighting load, but we're missing the point that the sustainment logistics move with them up the mountain, through the snow. It has to be brought with them. These are too harsh of environments. They are very unforgiving. You can't go to the ground and wait six hours for your supply train to catch up with you, but you can for light infantry and jungle infantry, they can. They're not going to freeze to death. They're not going to die of high altitude poisoning, okay, or sickness. But mountain and arctic infantry, you leave them on the ground six hours, you come back, they're all dead. So the logistics has to move with them, and this makes them quite different as light infantry. They're not similar in that regard to light and jungle. They are very affordable still, but as you can imagine, Arctic and mountain gear. There is some very specialized gear, which can get quite expensive. It's far more expensive than just light infantry, but still one of the cheaper formations to build. Still, if you don't have Arctic or a mountain in your country, why would you need them, right? So what's the problem? Once again, when these mountain and arctic infantry are caught in the open terrain by enemy mechanized cavalry, close air support, or artillery, they are remarkably vulnerable. The good news is that mountain infantry are rarely caught in the open because that's the terrain they're in. Same with arctic, to a lesser degree, but still the same can be said, that they use their terrain, their climate, to their advantage, so it's less likely that they will be caught in open terrain. So that's mountain and arctic, and you can see how that juxtaposed against light and jungle. The last two we're left with are air assault infantry and airborne infantry. Both are versions of light or dismounted infantry, as we'll get to in a minute. But they are, a lot of people assume, well, they're both vertical insertion infantry. They're specialized to that. It's both absolutely true. They are specialized light infantry to vertical insertion, okay, going up in the air and landing behind or on top of the enemy. But they are remarkably different in operations and, um, you know, and expenses like the equipment they use. So 
Air Assault Infantry uses rotary wing, be that an Osprey, which is a you know a hybrid, it's fixed and rotary, but anyway, vertical lift rotary wing aircraft, and then foot mobility once they get there. So everything is carried. It's like Alpine Infantry, uh, but you don't have a pack mule. It's like Arctic Infantry, but you don't have an Akio sled. No, no, no. We're going to put it all on your back and then drop you off in God knows where and you'll be miserable. So um, everything is carried. Because of the aircraft, you can imagine this moves very, very fast, lightning fast, way too fast for the enemy often to respond, and then goes very, very slow because we're on foot all of a sudden. Air Assault Infantry strike, seize, or block enemy forces or assets in preparation for follow-on forces. So Air Assault Infantry are vertical insertion, smash the heck out of the enemy. Now they can do a raid and then come back, but more often they smash the enemy, block the enemy, seize the enemy in preparation that other ground forces, say mechanized cavalry units, are coming and going to reinforce them or relieve them. And so that's how they operate but they are incredibly expensive. This is the most expensive, not airborne, air assault is the most expensive of the dismounted infantry formations by far because vertical lift helicopters are incredibly expensive. And oh, by the way, don't have massive capabilities. We don't have helicopters that lift, you know, 200 soldiers, but we do have fixed wing that lift that easily. And then some, you need a lot of them and they're very expensive. They're also, these aircraft are also, problem number one, they are vulnerable to enemy air defense. Let's look at two um, recent models. In the Desert Storm, you know, Persian Gulf War, right? Operation Desert Storm, the 101st Air Assault Division conducted a multiple hundred, I forget what it is, like 200 miles strike deep north into the enemy's rear area. This was hotly contested and this was a real risk to do because these are helicopters and generally you don't go out of the brigade's umbrella of support. That means direct air support or close air support and artillery and they did that. They, you know, that's, that's what, 30 miles, 40 miles, something like this at its extreme end. These guys went 250 miles outside of that. This is dangerous, dangerous stuff. The Russians also did this recently in Ukraine when they seized, tried to seize Kiev and they seized the airport around it and everything else. They too got into their helicopters and did a vertical insertion into the airport north of Kiev. But look at the difference. So that's how they are similar long distance attacks going uh, well outside of any umbrella of support. But let me back that off a little bit because the difference was that by the time the, Aris, uh, the 101st did this, the Americans did this in the Persian Gulf War, we not only had air dominance, so the helicopters could be backed up by fixed wing fighters um, and bombers. So we not only had air dominance, not merely air superiority, but air dominance, but we had at that point really done what's known as SEED, suppression of enemy air defense. So uh, there, you know, the enemy had been seeded, so to speak. And so it was determined, hey, let's try this. We think we can pull it off. And it was a, a real feather in the 101st cap. I mean, it really was. It was an attack uh, hundreds of miles into the enemy's rear. It was successful. It worked. The Russians tried this in Ukraine back in uh, February and it did not work. It did not work because they did not have air dominance. They barely established air superiority and they certainly did not have effective seed, uh, suppression of enemy air defense. And so this went very badly. Initially it went well for the Russians, but then it went very badly for them. So you can see that when I say one of the problems with air assault formations, they have very expensive uh, equipment, airborne vehicles, that are very vulnerable to enemy attack, air attack, and air defense. The other problem is, of course, when they get on the ground, they're still dismounted infantry. So once again, the infantry themselves, fast and slow, and they're vulnerable if caught in open train by enemy mech and cavalry. Once again, in Persian Gulf War, they said, hey, we've got air dominance, we're gonna give them close air support. And they immediately flew in their artillery as well. So that backed them up. So we've talked about that. 
So what are airborne infantry then and how are they different? Well, once again, they're a variation of light infantry, dismounted infantry, specialized to vertical insertion. They fly fixed wing, very fast moving fixed wing, and then transition once they parachute down to foot mobility. Sometimes they don't parachute down, sometimes they actually land at an airport. But whatever the case is, everything is carried. Those poor bastards have everything on their back, just like the air assault. They go very, very fast in fixed-wing aircraft, and then slow once they get on the ground. They, too, strike, seize, or block enemy forces in preparation for follow-on friendly forces. Think about, you know, the airborne uh, landings in Normandy in World War II in 1944. And then they were waiting for um, the amphibious assault land forces to come in and, and back them up. And then, in fact, that's what happened. Airborne forces are somewhat expensive, far less expensive than air assault forces, but more expensive because of the aircraft and the specialized equipment than the other forms. Once again, the problem is that they are vulnerable to enemy air force um, and to enemy air defense. This is because airborne forces do not paratroop 20, 30, 40 miles in front of the brigade or division. They routinely drop into deep into the enemy lines that are commonly multiple 100, 200, 300 or more miles into enemy rear areas to conduct combat strikes, seizing of assets and blocking of enemy forces. So you definitely want to have air dominance when you're using airborne forces because again they're going deep, deep, deep into um, into enemy terrain. Once they get on the ground, poor bastards are carrying everything, and in most cases they didn't come with adequate mechanized forces or artillery. They can bring those in, uh, but those are rare and expensive, and so if they're caught in open terrain by enemy cavalry, mechanized cavalry, close air support, or artillery, once again the jig is up. They're, they're at the losing end here, and we've seen this time and time again in history. This is so precarious that same with air assault, but really more so with airborne, that we've tried air uh, nighttime uh, airborne drops, and they were rather disastrous, very confusing, although less casualties. We've tried daytime air uh, drops, and they tend to be less confusing, but higher casualties. So there have been many times where people rightfully asked, is airborne a dead concept? But I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think anytime you can drop a brigade, uh, you know, or a division or multiple divisions behind enemy lines, you can uh, you know, wreak havoc and disrupt the enemy's defenses and disrupt the enemy's counterattacks. And so I think it still has, um, you know, its relevance even today. But again, uh, somewhat cheaper than air assault, but um, used for very deep battle where air assault should actually not be going 200 miles into the enemy's rear. It should stay within the brigade or division or corps at the very minimum. Um, you know, umbrella of support. We have talked about one, two, three, four, five, six different types of light infantry formations. They are light and jungle infantry. Uh, they are mountain and arctic infantry. They are air assault infantry and airborne infantry. While they have much in common, um, they have distinct differences that I say go far beyond nuanced differences. And so that's the pros and cons of having these different um, dismounted infantry formations, their continued value and relevancy in the battle space, um, and of course from a strategic or operational view, um, why they are, most of them, are so affordable compared to mechanized forces. All right, thanks for uh, hanging out with us today. <laughs> I'll talk to you later.